Pittsburgh Church, how are we doing this morning? It's good to see you. It's good to be with you. Special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We are so glad that you're with us this morning. So it was earlier this year, and I was uh, leaving work here at church, and I was heading home, and I was going up 70th Street, and I passed by Metro Market, and I took a left onto St. James Street to take a quick right onto 70th Street again as it kind of zigzags through those uh, neighborhoods up there. And as I turned right onto 70th Street, I was met by these guys. You seen these guys around? Yeah, just like right in the middle of the road, just hanging out. There's a bunch of them. And man, when I, like when I see these turkeys, like I just want to mow them over. Like <laughs> they drive me up a wall. Now some people love them. They think it's cute. They think they're cuddly. We need animal rights protection over them. I'm like, the turkeys in Wauwatosa are less like wildlife and they're more like a gang of thugs. I mean, they just, they do whatever they want. They're like, who runs the world? Turkeys run the world. That's who. So I'm standing there and there's like, like me on one side of the turkeys, another car on the other side of the turkeys. And it's like, you know, how are we going to get by? Like I tried to intimidate them. Like I tried to like inch forward a little bit closer didn't budge at all. I saw that I had enough room to kind of scoot around them on the right, and I started to go around them, and I swear the thing took a step to say, "Mm mm-mm, you ain't going nowhere. So I, I kind of like shimmied my way to the very edge of the road and kind of got around them, and then right there, like it just stayed right there, and it like looked into my window like it was trying to intimidate me to say, I'll let you pass this time, but next time you may not be so lucky, right? Now, there's controversy surrounding these turkeys because, again, some people think we should protect them, which I don't understand because all this last week, like, we were doing nothing but eating turkeys. Like, that's what we were doing. So, like, just ship them off, slaughter them, give them for Thanksgiving meals to somebody, and they're not going anywhere. Like, they're multiplying. Two weeks ago, I was driving to church one morning, and I saw, I counted 18 turkeys. And there's like all these little babies. I'm like, they are going to grow everywhere. Now, if they were people, we would call the cops on them, right? As they harass people in parking lots at grocery stores, they try and bully their way into outposts. There's even news reports of them harassing delivery drivers all through the different neighborhoods. Now, the thing that's going on with these turkeys, and if we're honest, somehow we've probably created this problem because there's probably people out there who are feeding them and everything, But the turkeys have grown comfortable in a context that is not natural to them, right? They've grown comfortable in a context that is not natural to them, and they essentially have forgotten who they are. They have forgotten that they're turkeys, and they operate more like community members. And the way that they live, it's almost as though they are saying to us, you should be lucky that we let you live here, right? They've forgotten who they are, and they've grown comfortable in a context that is not natural to them. And the same could be said of us, that we too have grown comfortable in a context that's not natural to us, meaning the way that Scripture says we are to understand our life here in this world is that we have a greater citizenship elsewhere. Philippians 3 says says our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await our Savior from there. First Peter chapter 2 says that we are foreigners. We are aliens. We are strangers. We are exiles in this world. This world is not our home. Hebrews 13 says we don't have a lasting city in this world. We are awaiting a heavenly city, a better city that will last forever. So in the here and now, sometimes we grow comfortable in a context that is not natural to us because our true home is with the Lord. And sometimes when we get comfortable in a place that is not natural to us, we easily think more highly of ourselves than we ought. And we think we're more important than we truly are. Like earlier this fall, I was at a conference. It was a pastor's conference. And I saw this guy named Brian there. I was like, man, strong name. Way to go, Brian. (laughs) And he had it spelled correctly to boot, with a Y, not an I. And we so naturally, like, we just struck up a conversation. And as we're in conversation, we both look at each other and we're like, man, you look familiar. 
you know, have we met before? Has there been a pastor's gathering that we've been at together before? And like, we're just talking around each other's lives. And then we come to realize that we were both at a summer camp together a couple years ago. I was speaking at this summer camp. He was there with his family just attending the summer camp. And we're like, oh yeah, and we kind of recalled that conversation and that week of camp. And then we parted ways. And as soon as I parted ways, the first thought into my mind was like, he should have remembered me, right? Like, I was the speaker of the week. I mean, it's natural for me to forget him because there was a few hundred people there. I can't remember everybody's name at a camp, but if I'm the speaker at a camp, somehow he should remember me. Like, when I forget who I am, I readily and quickly think more highly of myself than I should. And what happens is I become entitled and I become arrogant. And I think in some ways, I actually run the world. We easily think too highly of ourselves when we lose sight of who we are and we grow comfortable in a place that is not natural to us. And so the question is, how do we fight against that? Like, how do we work against that so that we don't become entitled or arrogant, but we somehow rest into a place of gratitude that naturally and effortlessly flows from our lives. Well, Psalm 100 gives us the way to do that. Psalm 100 gives us the roadmap to thanksgiving and gratitude. And this is how Psalm 100 begins. We read this in verse 1. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Now, one of the things that we regularly do on a Sunday morning as part of our worship service is what we call a call to worship. It usually happens during the, the, the songs at the beginning in between one of the songs, and it usually is some reflection on a passage of Scripture, and maybe the worship leader tells a little story of their experience with God or their observation from that passage. So Travis this morning said a few things from the book of Acts and talked about Paul and how Paul was able to have his story redeemed and God can redeem all of our stories. We call that a, a call to worship. And the intention with a call to worship is that it's supposed to be an invitation. An invitation into the worship moment and to enter in with a certain posture and attitude as we come in. And Psalm 100 works in a very similar way. Essentially, it's an invitation to worship, and it's an invitation to enter into worship with a certain posture and attitude. And the attitude and the posture that the psalmist is calling us to enter into with is exuberance. I mean, did you catch that? The first few words, shout for joy to the Lord. And he's addressing this, not just to the people who might be in front of him or reading this, but all the earth. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Which raises the question, when was the last time you entered into a worship service shouting at the top of your lungs for who God is? Now, if you do come in shouting, there's a really good chance you have kids. <laughs> and the reason you're shouting is you're shouting at your kids. Like, put your shoes back on. You don't kick your shoes off when you come into church. No, you can't have a lollipop until after. Put that lemonade. Why did you spill the lemonade? Don't hit your sister. Get to your class. We're here to worship the Lord, right? <laughs> but the psalmist is saying, no, no, we come in shouting for joy because of who God is. Now, the invitation here is that we would burst forth like a dam that's about to burst with water. And the invitation is to come in with that exuberance and excitement. But truthfully, the, the tone or the mood of Psalm 100 is probably stronger than an invitation. Because an invitation implies that you can either accept or decline that invitation. But here it seems as though the psalmist is not just inviting us, but specifically instructing us. He's telling you how to worship. And you could even say it's a little bit stronger than instruction because for all you English majors out there, the, the term shout, the word shout is actually an imperative. It's a command. It's telling you this is what you will do. In Hebrew, Psalm 100 is 42 words long, only 42 words. Seven of those 42 words 
are specific commands on how you will worship. The first one is shout. Shout for joy to the Lord. And then verse 2, it's you will worship and you will come in. Verse 3, it's know who God is. Verse 4 says enter, give, praise. Those are all commands. They're imperatives on here is how you will worship. And I think the reason for the strong language in Psalm 100 is because the psalmist knows how powerful the act of worship is, how powerful it is in shaping our lives, aiming our love, and pointing our life in a specific direction. It cultivates love. Worship cultivates love. You natu- naturally worship what you love. The thing is, with worship, worship, you can't not worship. You were created to worship. It's inherent to who you are as a human being. You were created to worship, so you can't not worship. The question is, what are you worshiping? And the thing that you naturally worship is the thing that you find to be the most beautiful, the most valuable, the most precious, the thing that captures your imagination the most. It's the thing that stands at the center of your life, and you order the rest of your life around that thing, that person, or that idea, because it just overwhelms your heart, and you love that thing, and you can't imagine your life without that thing. That's worship, and you can't not do it. The psalmist knows that worship has this powerful force in your life to shape your love. The question is, again, not are you worshiping, but who or what are you worshiping? And essentially, the psalmist here is giving us three things that that worship does. When, When we come into a space like this, and we understand that God is calling us for Him, to be the center of our worship. The first thing that worship does is worship reorients. Specifically, worship reorients us to God. Notice the first few words of verse 3. It says, know that the Lord is God. Right? Know, one of those seven commands in this psalm. Know that the Lord is God. Now, at one level, that little sentence might sound weird because typically we think of the word Lord and God as synonyms and kind of like proper names of God. They are used interchangeably as proper names. And so at one level it would be like saying, hey, know that Dave is David, right? Know that the Lord is God. Know that Dave is David or know that Tom is Thomas. Like it's two words that are referring to the same person. And at one level, yes, but it's a little bit more nuanced than that. Because in Hebrew, the word Lord is the word Yahweh. That, that would be the proper name of God. When God reveals himself to Moses in Exodus 6, he says, I am Yahweh. I'm the God of your ancestors, Jacob. And Isaac, I am Yahweh. He gives his proper name. This is who I am. But then the word God in Hebrew here is the word Elohim, which would be kind of like a generic general word for God. It would be the same way that in Spanish their word for God is Dios. In Hebrew, it just happens to be Elohim. It's a general term to talk about God, not necessarily the specific person of Yahweh. And the mindset of people in the ancient world was that there was all sorts of gods. There was gods for every which way, every day of the week, every sort of activity, every sort of part of creation. There's all of these gods. And the thing that the Bible is trying to communicate is actually, no, there's one God. It is Yahweh. God says, know that Yahweh is Elohim. God, Yahweh, is the one, only, true God. And so worship, when we come into a space like this, is intended to reorient us to God, to who he is, that he's Yahweh, the God over everything. But worship also reorients us to ourselves. Because we might come in and agree, like we might mentally think like, oh yeah, I I know that Yahweh is Elohim, that Yahweh is God. We might say we know that and believe that, But sometimes we act and we live 
as though we are. We are God. Because we live in a culture that oftentimes prioritizes us to us rather than anything else. Like if you were to walk into Burger King, what's Burger King's slogan? Hey, have it your way. Like we are here to serve you so that you can have life your way on your terms. This is an image of like what used to be their cup. On the side of their cup, they had their slogan. But what's so shocking about this image is not so much the the slogan, have it your way, it's the text underneath the slogan that reads this. You have the right to have what you want exactly when you want it because on the menu of life, you are today's special and tomorrow's and the day after that. And, well, you get the drift. That's right. We may be the king, but you, my friend, are the almighty ruler. Right? Wow. This is the message that our culture readily gives us. Hey, have life your way. You were designed to have it your way, and anybody who gets in the way of you having it your way should get pushed out of their way, right? We're here to serve you and have it your way. So naturally, we wake up in the morning and we think, yeah, this is my world. I will have things my way, and I'm the one who's at the center of it, and everything revolves around me. So worship is intended to reorient us to God as to who He is and reorient ourselves to ourselves in light of being who we are in light of who God is. And again, notice what comes next in verse 3. It says, Know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us. So Psalm 100 reorients us to God, being the King and Lord, and now He's added to that the Creator of all things. That God is the Creator of everything. And Psalm 100 reorients us to ourselves in light of who God is, in that we are part of his creation, right? It is he who made us. And I don't know if there is ever a scenario when creation supersedes its creator. Because creation is an extension of the creator. Creation is intended to point back and glorify the one who created it. Because the creator is the one who originated the creativity, the design, the intellect, the plan of the thing that it was created. So um, a couple years ago, I was walking in our neighborhood and we had this neighbor who lived on our block um, back then who had his window, his like dining room blinds open and it was evening time and I was walking my dog and I peeked up into his dining room, and I could see this massive painting on the wall. It was this big, beautiful painting, and I was just captivated by it. Like, I wanted to just stop and, like, look at it. But I realized if he came to the window, (laughs) what he would see is some stranger, like, peeking into his dining room at some weird hour of the night. So I just did a quick glance, and I was like, I got to keep moving. But every time I would walk by his dining room, and that blinds were open, I'd glance a peek because I was just so captivated. The colors that he used, it was like the texture of the paint. It was huge. And I was like, man, that's amazing. So one day I'm walking and there's this guy out on uh, the, the sidewalk coming out of the house. And I was like, hey, and I introduced myself, strike up a conversation. And I said, I, okay, like, I know this is going to sound weird and I, I don't mean to be creepy here, but hey, can you tell me about that painting in your dining room? Like every time I look at it, I'm just like captivated by it. Where did you get it? And then he's like, oh yeah, I I painted it. I was the one who did it. And all of a sudden, all of my attention moved from the painting to this guy. He's like, tell me about it. Tell me about you. Where did you get your schooling and your training and all this from? And so it was no longer that I was infatuated with the painting. I was really curious about the painter because the painting, the creation, naturally points back to the creator, the one who made it. And what the psalmist is saying is that God is the creator over all things, and who you are is part of his creation. And so the intention of our lives is not that we are the almighty ruler or king or anything, but our lives are intended to be a signpost back to the glory of the one who created us. Now, even though you are not the king, 
And even though you are not the almighty ruler, you still have value. You still have significance because, as we read throughout the scriptures, we are created in God's image. His imprint, his stamp is upon us. We are created to mirror his likeness. And this is the way that we are described. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. God cares for you. God values you. God loves you in the same way that a shepherd cares for his sheep. And in the Old Testament, all through the New Testament even, this imagery of a sheep and the shepherd is a common description to capture our relationship with God. In the same way that a shepherd makes sure his sheep have everything they need. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack what? Nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. In the same way that a shepherd is present with his sheep, in the same way that he provides for his sheep, he protects them from the evil forces of the world. God cares for you. He loves you. He sees that you have immense value. And in John 10, where Jesus uses this image of him being a shepherd, a good shepherd, it says that he calls his sheep by name. He knows us intimately by name and calls you by name to lead you where he wants you to go. And he's described as a good shepherd. God cares for you immensely, more than you could ever imagine. And so what worship does is it reorients us to God, who he is, and all of his goodness and glory, and his creativity to create everything. And it reorients us to ourselves in light of who God is, that we are part of his good creation, that we are created in his image, and he thinks the world of you. Now, not only does worship reorient us, worship also retells. Specifically, it retells our story. In verse 3, there's this little phrase that describes who we are. We are his people. That's a wildly significant phrase because it's a subtle callback to the book of Exodus, right? God reveals himself to Moses in Exodus 6, and he says, my people are in captivity in Egypt, living as slaves, building Pharaoh's empire for him. Moses, I want you to go to Pharaoh and redeem my people from slavery. So Moses goes after some hemming and hawing, and he has this showdown with Pharaoh, and eventually they get to this point where Pharaoh releases his people back to God. And then they go out into the desert and spend time in the desert. And what God does for his people in the desert is he gives them a new identity. He says, no longer are you to view yourselves as slaves, but now you are free people. And in Exodus 19, God calls them his treasured possession. Ah, you are my treasured possession. Then if you go into the book of Leviticus, right, he enters into a covenant, an intentional relationship with his people. And in this covenantal relationship, he says, you will be my people. And so when the psalmist here is saying, it is he who created us, we are his, we are his people, it's a callback to the redemptive story of Exodus, of God saying, I am going to take what is mine and you belong to me. And for ancient Israel, this story was always before them. The story of the Exodus, the story of God's redemption was always before them. And everything that they did, all their festivals, their traditions, their rituals, their laws, their celebrations, all of it was basically retelling and rehearsing the story of God's redemption. That's what the story was all about. And the interesting thing is their story has become our story. Not so much that we were enslaved by a foreign king who needed to be released from captivity, but left to ourselves, we are enslaved to sin and death. And the story that we are constantly telling is one of God's redemption, that in our captivity to sin and death, God has entered into our situation to set us free, 
to give us a new lease on life, to call us back to him and put us in our rightful place and a rightful relationship with him. We're telling that story constantly. We're entering into a season, starting next week with the Advent season, that tells the story of Jesus leaving his rightly place in heaven at the right hand of the Father to enter into our world as a lowly baby born to two parents who probably don't have a clue of what they're about to get into, right? To be born in a barn in hay with livestock. To ultimately live and move among us as we move into the spring to tell the story of Easter to die on a cross for our sins, for the sin of the entire world, to go into a tomb for three days, and then to come out of that tomb defeating death, showing that death doesn't have a hold on him, it doesn't have a hold on us, and in coming back from dead, the dead, he's starting a new creation project that one day is going to overtake the entire world. That's the story we are constantly retelling. That's the story that Scripture is constantly retelling, that Jesus stands at the center of it all. I mean, this morning, we sang about it, right? In, in that first song, it says, I was a wretch. I remembered who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. And sin separated. That's what sin does. It separates us. The breach was far too wide, but from the far side of the chasm, you had me in your sight. Like God has always got eyes on you. Not like some like weird, creepy guy who's trying to stalk you or keep track of you, but he always knows your situation. It says, so you made a way across the great divide. You left behind heaven's throne to build one here inside. There at the cross... You paid the debt I owed. You broke my chains. You freed my soul. And for the first time, I had hope. The story that we are constantly telling is the story of redemption. That no one is too far gone from the outstretched, redeeming hand of God. No one has a life that is too messed up that can't be put back together. Nobody's life is too broken or too decimated that they don't have a second chance that God might give them. Like, that's the story that we're always telling. So worship reorients us to God and ourselves, and it also retells our story. When we think of communion, we're embodying the story of God's redemptive love. When we have baptisms and people go under the water, symbolizing being washed clean, washed white as snow, and they come up out of the water, symbolizing new creation, and what God has done, the forgiveness that he has offered. We are constantly retelling the story of who God is and what he has done in our life. And as we do that, it reinforces our identity that we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. So not only does worship reorient, not only does it retell our story, it also remembers. It helps us remember what God has done. Verse 5, if we jump ahead to verse 5, it says, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. See, when we lose sight of who God is and when we lose sight of who we are in light of who God is, we easily forget. We easily and quickly forget. Again, go back to the story of the Exodus. God redeems his people from slavery in Egypt. And if you follow the flow of the narrative, it's chapter 12 through chapter 14 of Exodus. They leave Egypt. They come to the Red Sea. And what do they think? We're done. We're done. Because Pharaoh has changed his mind. He's pursuing us. He wants us back. And here we are. There's this massive body of water in front of us that we can't cross. We might as well start digging graves now because we're done. And what does God do? He parts the sea. It says they walk across on dry land. And when Pharaoh's army tries to pursue them, the sea comes back over and swallows them whole. And now they are finally free. Then, so when you cross into chapter 15 of Exodus, there's this beautiful worship song. Oh, see what God has done. The horse and rider have been swallowed up in the sea. A reference to Pharaoh's army drowning in the sea. It's this amazing rescue, this amazing victory. Look at what God has done. As soon as you cross into chapter 16, do you know what starts to happen? Like right from the get-go, the people of God are saying, ah, we should be back in Egypt. We should have died there because, God, there's no food. There's no water. There's nothing. You've just brought us out to the desert to die. Instantly, they're complaining. 
And it's really easy to like read the book of Exodus and be like, those stinking Israelites. Like only if they had their act together. But how many of us, right? It says in verse 5 that we should remember his faithfulness for generations. I mean, if I look back on my life, I can see from my parents' life to my grandparents' life, how God is faithful and bringing me all the way to where I am today. Forget that. Like, I forget yesterday what happened. Like, I forget the goodness of God yesterday in my life or last week, and it's so easy for me to complain. See, what worship does is it helps us remember that, that God is good. It helps us remember the goodness of God and the way that He provides the way he leads us forward from one day to the next, the way he is always present with us, and in times of trouble and difficulty, he's like, hey, hey, I am in it with you. It reminds us of his goodness. It also reminds us of his faithfulness, the way that he has been continually present in our lives, and the way that he continually makes good on his promises. I mean, you could say that's what the Bible is all about. It's about God making promises and then bringing those promises to fruition. Once the world falls apart to sin and death, God says, I'm going to put it back together and I will never let go of that promise. Never. And he hasn't. And worship reminds us that we are in the middle of it. See, what happens when you're in a difficult situation, you universalize the particular. Meaning, you look at your difficult situation and you say, all of life is this way, all of life has been this way, and all of life will continue to be this way. You take the difficulty that you're in in the here and now, and you just universalize it to every area of your life. Life is terrible. Life is horrible. I can't ever get it right. We universalize that difficult moment. And what we need to do is get our head up. We need to get our head up and refocus our heart and our mind on God. Who He is, and who we are in light of who He is. What He has done for us throughout all generations. And when we do that, the thing that starts to flow out of our life is gratitude. So you could say it this way, the psalmist is trying to tell us that it's His faithfulness that leads to thankfulness. His faithfulness fuels our thankfulness. Because in between verse 3, where he talks about who he is and who we are in light of who he is and what he has done for us and making his, him, making us his people, and what he says in verse 5 about his goodness, his steadfast love, and his faithfulness is chapter, verse 4 rather, that says this, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. See, when we enter into worship and it reorients us to him, to who we are in light of who he is and what he has done in our life, it's like, oh, how could I not be thankful? And then the call is to take that gratitude back into the world and live out of that place from one day to the next. Which means when we forget the thing that we are called to do, is to worship. Because again, you can't not worship. You don't have to come to church to worship. You don't have to be in a service to worship. The call and the invitation of Psalm 100 is to live that way all the time. So um, some of you were here earlier this fall when I kind of gave some reflection on my sabbatical from this summer. And one of the things that I find surface, surfacing in my heart from time to time, and it was apparent this summer, was that it's really easy for me to compare myself to other people. And when I start to compare myself to other people, I start to live in this narrative of like, why don't I have what they have? Why is my life not like that over there? Why, you, God, you should be giving me that thing, and when I'm not getting that thing, I think, God, you've done nothing for me, right? It's really easy for me to slip into that place. So this week, I was kind of flipping through my journal, just kind of like looking through some things that I had written recently, and I came across this list. It was a gratitude list because I was coming out of this place feeling sorry for myself, feeling like I was a victim, feeling like everybody else's life was better than mine, and I'm just going to wallow in self-pity. And so I said, I need to get out of this funk. And I just started writing down the things I was grateful for. Lord, I'm grateful for this. 
God, you have done this in my life. God, this sabbatical that I'm on is such a major gift. God, the fa- family time I've been able to have, man, look at this over here, what you've done in my life. And God, when I look back on a year from now and where I was, and here I am today, like, oh, I can count all of these things. See, when we find ourselves in a place when life is hard, difficult, and not working the way we want it to, it's the attitude of worship and recognizing his faithfulness that will ultimately lead to thankfulness. And we can find gratitude just flows from our heart. So we're entering into this season, the holiday season. Some people love the holiday season. I love the holiday. I do. I love it. I love it all. But for many people, it's hard. It brings up all sorts of thoughts and feelings. And sometimes they're like, can we just skip the whole month of December? Like, can we just skip from Thanksgiving right to New Year and start over? My invitation to you is if that's you, to practice gratitude, to, to put into practice this week, write down three things. Well, God, I'm thankful for this. I'm grateful for this. One of the things that creating that gratitude list in my journal helped me do is every time I write in my journal, I write the same thing right from the get-go. Lord, I thank you for the gift of today because today is a gift. We're not guaranteed today. We're not guaranteed tomorrow when I wake up in the morning and... We got breath in my lungs. Lord, that is a good gift from you. The practice of gratitude and thankfulness can change your life. It recogni- helps you recognize you're not at the center of it. God is. He's holding it all together. And when you start to look for the good things that he has done for you, you will see them in spades in your life. And then you find that gratitude just naturally flows. So may you know that the Lord is God. May you believe that you are His. You belong to Him. You are the sheep of His pasture. And may you experience His faithfulness every day. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your goodness. We thank you so much for your faithfulness. We recognize, Lord, that you are a good and gracious God. You have done so much for us that we don't deserve. I pray that you would give us eyes to see that. That you would give us eyes to see that you would be our vision and you would give us eyes to see what it is you have done and are doing and will do. All in and through your son, Jesus Christ, who laid down his life for us so that we might once again belong to you. May that recognition of your faithfulness fuel gratitude. And may we be people who easily and quickly and readily point the world back to you. Pray this in your name. Amen.